17. Um, we've been studying prayer and talking about prayer, and tonight we want to talk about a reviving prayer. Now, I'm probably not going to approach this the way you would think that I would approach it, because when we're talking about a reviving prayer, we're talking about you know, a prayer that brings us to a place of revival in our own hearts and in our own lives. And I'm going to tell you now that there's not just a single prayer that does that. When we're talking about being revived and talking about praying that God will rejuvenate us and, and bring us back to that place where we have all that zeal and that passion, there's a lot of other things that have to be considered. And there's a lot of other things that need to be prayed for before we ever really get back to that place. Um, I mean, we're talking about you know, maybe a prayer of confession. Maybe there's sin in my life that's caused it. Maybe there's, you know, maybe there are circumstances that's surrounding my life that has me discouraged or has me in some sort of despair. Maybe that needs to be resolved. Or, you know, you, you never know what all can be going on that brings you to a place where sometimes you don't even realize you need to be revived. You know, sometimes everything just seems to be going right in the world for you. And you forget, you don't realize that just because it seems to be going right from our standpoint doesn't mean it's going right from God's standpoint. We still might not be where we ought to be. You know, you may have all the money you need to pay all the bills that you have. You may have a good relationship with your spouse. You may have, seems like everybody in your family is good and healthy right now. It may, may be great, but that doesn't mean that our heart and our mind is right where God needs it to be so that we can be used. And so we need to just think about all of those things. Tonight, I want to focus on prayer that gives us basically that revival spirit. And this prayer is not going to seem like that to you, but it, I hope that by the time we get to the end of it, that you'll, you'll understand. But I think prayer is the most essential element in our Christian faith. And so obviously, when it comes time that we're looking at our life and going, you know, something needs to change, I think it always, always, always has to start with prayer. Uh, William Booth, for those of you that don't know who that is, he's the founder of the Salvation Army. He said this, work as if everything depends on you and pray as if everything depends on God. And so that's pretty much what we need to do. We need to put every effort we can into everything that we do as though we're the ones that have to get it done. But we need to pray in such a way that we recognize and know that, listen, nothing can be done if it wasn't for God doing it. All right. Uh, revival has to begin uh, really with a revival of prayer because there, there can't be any revival without prayer. And so our lives are not going to be the revival at Pentecost. And it was a revival at Pentecost. And I'll explain that to you. But the revival at Pentecost began with prayer in the upper room. And here's what I want you to know. What took place at Pentecost? Three thousand people getting saved was not revival. That wasn't revival. That was a result of revival. The revival took place in the upper room where that small church was praying. That's where the revival took place. Revival never takes place among lost people. Revival takes place among the saved people. It's kind of funny when we talk about the church having a revival. For some reason, the first thing that comes to our mind is, boy, I hope we have people saved in our revival. That's not revival. That's results of revival. You know, it's great to see people saved at any point in time. I mean, quite frankly, I love to see people come to know Jesus Christ, their Lord and Savior. But that never happens until revival comes. What has to happen is there has to be revival in the hearts and lives of God's people. There has to be a restoration of that zeal and that passion. There has to be a rejuvenation, if you would, of all that we are in Jesus Christ if we're going to see things like that take place. And so what happens is, is we have to see revival take place. And so the revival took place in the upper room. They were eyewitnesses of Jesus' death, burial, resurrection. And now they were praying for the power of God to come upon them so that great things could take place. And there they are praying, you know, in the upper room. And God does a great work among them. Is when he get, you know, grants to them the Holy Spirit of God. He comes down like a dove. And, and then we see him out, you know. Uh, and I'll take it back. That was back when Jesus was baptized. But he comes upon them. And then you get to Pentecost, you know, and they go out and they begin preaching to the people. And, and God uses that in a great way. But all of that is a result 
of the revival that took place in the hearts and lives of the people. You know, Ezra, back in the Old Testament, knew that Israel was not going to be revived without prayer. The very first thing he did was fell on his knees for prayer. What did Nehemiah do? He did the exact same thing. What did Abraham do? You know, Abraham prayed at Bethel knowing that he needed a closer walk with God. Paul and Silas, when they were put in the Philippian jail, I can't think of a time where they, you'd have to be pretty discouraged. You're out there doing what God wants you to do, and it seems like everything you do... It seems like it stirs up controversy. You wind up even either being beaten nearly to death or maybe beaten to death um, and, or, and or jailed. And it seemed like every time they went to a city and preached the gospel of Jesus Christ, they were either beaten or jailed. And so that's got to be pretty discouraging. I just got to be honest with you. I, I would be kind of discouraged. And here they are in jail. And while in jail, they start praying and singing. Revival comes and God does great things with that. And we know the story about how they led the Philippian jailer to the Lord. So we find that it, it, there has to be that prayer element that comes into play when we're talking about having revival. I, even in the life of Jesus. And you say, well, Jesus needed revival? Apparently, tells us that in Geth when he was in Gethsemane. Look at his prayer in Gethsemane. He immediately needed strength to face all the things that, that was ahead. You know, he said if, you know, he even asked the father to, to take that cup from him. But if there was no other way, obviously do whatever needed to be done. But there had to be in his heart, there had to be some, some, some pain, some agony, some hurt. And he was in need of that, that, that strength. So he prayed. And, you know, how much time, we've talked about this before, but how much time we spend in prayer says a great deal about how much we really trust the effectiveness of prayer. You know, if we really believe that prayer is going to do something, we're going to spend a lot more time in prayer. If we just think it's something to do, then we're not going to spend a lot of time in prayer. We're just going to do it and move on. But there are a lot of examples of prayer in scriptures, specifically really reviving prayer. But tonight I want to look at the prayer of Elijah regarding the widow's, uh, the widow's son. All right. The background on this, as you turn there, 1 Kings chapter 17, we're going to look at verses 8 through 24. I'm not going to read all of those, but I'm just going to pick apart some of it. But you can read it if you like while I kind of give you a quick background. The background is this. God blesses this widow's home for feeding and taking care of Elijah. If you remember, this is the, this is the widow where he came about and he said, you know, I need you to make me some, some, you know, some cakes. And she says, well, you know, I just went and gathered up enough to to make the very last that I had for my son and I. That's all we've got. We have no more oil. We have no more flour. It's all gone. And so basically what happens is, is uh, she goes ahead and makes it for Elijah like he requested, and God gave them a never-ending supply of flour and oil. All right? um, however, after all of this, after God's great blessing, after they've got to be overwhelmed with this incredible miracle that God bestows upon them, afterward, uh, her son dies. And she's pretty confused about all of this. Why would God allow such a thing to take place in her life? And so she begins to actually accuse Elijah. You know, why, why did you just come here so my son could die? Is this, why, is this what this is all about? It's interesting to me that she is so concerned about her son dying at this point when she had already kind of given up and realized they were going to eat the last meal and they were both going to die. But now all of a sudden, after the miracle that gave them food, sustained their life, now he dies and she's troubled by it. You know, it's like I, she's already prepared for this, but yet, you know, but we love the people that we love and we care for the people that we care for and we don't want them to part from us. We get that. We understand. I would be in the same shape as her. I'm not saying that she did something wrong here in that regard. I'm just saying it's interesting because she had already resolved herself to the fact that they were going to die. But now here we come to a place where all of a sudden he dies and she is in complete and total desperation. Um, you know, sometimes things happen in our life, by the way. And when we look at this, there doesn't have to be a reason. Sometimes we feel like there's always got to be a reason. You know, it, it's funny. There are some people that are like this. You feel like there has to be a reason or you have to blame somebody. It has to be somebody at fault for everything that takes place. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a strange bird because that's not the first thing that comes to my mind. First thing that comes to my mind, let's fix this. It doesn't matter who's at fault. It's done. You know, this has happened. It is what it is. You know, um, I had a wreck long back, you know, however long ago that's been now. And the first thing that Debbie said when I told her, who was at fault? Your first question wouldn't be, how am I doing? You know, second question, is the car totaled? You know, uh, but no, who was at fault? 
Well, I don't care who's at fault, right, at this moment, to be quite frank about it. I mean, when you get to the final point, I mean, then you have to resolve all those things, but that wasn't my first concern. But when you look at this picture, the first thing she did was begin blaming. Elijah, you're the reason. And then she starts blaming herself. Uh, and so you'll see that here in a moment. But begin to, she begins to get desperate and, and she's showing signs of desperation. But you know, here's the deal. We need to understand that it seems like, it just seems like this happens. But after a time of, I don't know, something wonderful, great blessings in our life, it seems like that there is, it, it, there is always, after that mountaintop experience, it seems like we're going to now take, take a little trip to the valley. And it seems like that happens a lot in our life. Something wonderful happens, but know that something's going to come along that's going to be kind of equally as horrible. And, and we kind of need to prepare ourselves for such things. And we need to realize that we live in a world that's just like that. You know, it's, it's just the way it is. I mean, here in Cincinnati, it was 70 degrees yesterday, and it's you know, 40 degrees today. It's, it is what it is. And so we need to realize that's kind of a picture of where our life runs. So we need to, we need to always be ready for that mountaintop and that valley. And the way we do that is having that revived spirit that we might trust the Lord in any and every situation and look to Him. All right, so God then uses Elijah to restore the son to life. That's what takes place. And, but we want to notice this, and then we'll get into the lesson, all right? Um, but after we get the idea that these men of the Bible were somehow these super extraordinary men, but according to Scripture, they're not. Elijah's just a guy. We get the idea, boy, Elijah's this wonderful, great giant of a man. I mean, he is a spiritual giant. But James 5, 16 and 18 says this about Elijah. Confess your faults one to another, pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias, or Elijah, same guy, was a man subject to like passions as we are. He's just a guy, just a man. Has all the same passions we have, all right? Just, just a man. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Saying, listen, we need to be so caught up in prayer that we realize a guy like Elijah is just a guy like us. And yet... He controlled the, literally controlled the weather by prayer. But he's just a guy with like passions like we are. And we stop and think, well, we don't live in that day of miracles any longer. And I get that. But I wonder sometimes if we do live in a day where we could see a whole lot more done if we were just people that had a greater passion for prayer and would spend more time in prayer. Here we find Elijah getting serious about his prayer. 1 Kings 17, picking up verse 17. All right. I want you to first see the despair that this widow woman had. I just want you to see this because I think it starts there. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. His sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, what have I to do with thee? All right. I'm going to blame you. All right. O thou man of God. And thou, uh, art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? Elijah, are you only here just so my son can die? You, the only reason you're really here, you're going to do this great miracle, restore my life just long enough so that you can say, listen, because of your sin, because of sin in your life, your son's going to die. That's what she's saying. She's saying, did you just come here long enough to restore his life long enough so that you could call out my sin and then accuse me in the fact that he dies. So she first blames Elijah. Then she even talks about her own sin. Okay, there, there's this sin in my life that you're going to reveal. Now, we don't even know what sin that might be. Uh, but apparently, she's looking at her life. She recognizes, like the rest of us would recognize, you know, there's sin in my life. I don't know about you, but I'm one of those guys that I could. Everything that happens wrong in my life, I'm going to tell you, I could find something that I've done and say, well, that was probably why. I could do that. I'm not naive enough to really think that that's always the reason things happen. We live in a world that's a sin-cursed world, and so things just happen. But by the same token, things can happen because of sin in our life, and I do know that. And so the first thing I start doing is looking at my own life saying, did I cause this? Was this my fault? Was it because of the sin that I've got in my life? And the first thing I start doing is repenting and getting things right. Too late, but still... I, it's just what comes natural, I guess. But what we find here is she says, listen, 
I, I get that there's sin in my life. I understand that. You know, I'm human. I don't know that there's some particular sin that's a real problem. But whatever, I want you to notice some things that brought this woman to a place where she is the one that needs the revival. And that's what I want you to see. She's not even, even the one we're seeing the prayer life of. But she is the one really in need of revival here because she's grasping at straws. She's had a great miracle take place in her life and still she is in complete and total despair. All right, in a time of desperation, I think what she forgot was the wonderful blessings and the miraculous gifts that was already bestowed upon her. She forgot how great a God that she served. I think that's important. Um, you know, we can have a thousand and one great things happen, but the one we're going to remember is the bad one. You know, if there's one little bad thing, to, that's what we remember. Uh, we'll focus on one bad thing. I've talked to people who have been part of the church and, and, and we've talked about different things, you know, and, I, and, and been a part of their life, been there when their children were born, you know, led them to the Lord, maybe even led their children to the Lord and, and visit them in the hospital and been with them in times of marriage and, you know, and circumstances in their lives and all those kinds of things. But all I got to do is say one thing that they took a little bit wrong or, or was offended by and it's that thing that they're going to hold to and they leave. And it's like, seriously? You're going to forget everything else and just hold to this? One, one bad move, one slip of the tongue, one something, you know? And, and this is what happens in her life. She has all this miraculous things that has surrounded her that God has done. How sad it is that we'll only focus on the worst of the issues. Well, her son died. That's a horrible thing. But she forgot how great a God she serves and that he had provided flour and oil to sustain them and never go dry. She had somehow forgotten that. And, and we forget the watch care of the Lord that has been a very real part of her life. I know this is a time of desperation for her. I get it. She's, she's down. She's beaten up. But we need to remember that God will never leave us, never forsake us. And I think that that's a hard thing to remember in times of despair. She needed revival. Notice how she blamed Elijah, right? Um, do you not have any sympathy? That's basically what she's asking, you know. Is your, your heart really that hard that you would watch us go through this and see that, you know, come in here with this great blessing and do great things, um, pretend like you're this loving and caring person, but really you only came to reveal my sin and take my son away. That's the accusation. She becomes, she, she comes from this loving, caring person that's willing to take care of Elijah, now all of a sudden to being his accuser. All right? And this is what happens. There was truly a need for revival in her life. All right? She needed a new perspective of both God and she needed a new perspective of the, of the man that God chose to help her in all of this. A third thing is she wallowed in self-pity. Oh, woe is me. I feel sorry for me. Notice that she assumed that her sins, whatever they might be, was going to be called out by Elijah uh, as the reason for her son's death. A need for revival is often revealed in how we view God's people, God's church, God's leaders. And how we view others often will tell the world whether or not we really need revival. Because what we find is that, you know, I get sick of hearing people say that they no longer attend a church because that church is, I don't know, too strict, too uppity, uh, too holier than thou. When what they're really saying is, I don't like having my sins called out. I, I, don't, I don't want to be offended. I don't want people to call me out because I did something wrong. I don't want that pastor preaching on something because it's what's, what I'm guilty of. I don't want that in my life. So self-pity becomes this sure sign of a need for revival. We start wallowing in our own self-pity. Woe is me. Look at what's happening to me. Oh, this is the worst thing. Nobody in the world ever has to deal with anything that I have to deal with. I got news for you. You're not dealing with anything any different than anybody else in the world has dealt with. I mean, if I were to ask for a show of hands, and I'm not, but if I were to ask for a show of hands, quite frankly, everybody here has probably had loved ones die. You've probably had to deal with maybe some illness, could have been a major illness. You probably have had to deal with job loss. You maybe have had to deal with, you know, people that have hurt you, you know. You've probably had to deal with, um, you know, church hurt. You've probably had to deal with all of those kinds of things at one point in time or another. And, and it would be easy for us to get consumed with that and fall into a place of self-pity and say, woe is me. Well, here's the thing. She was in that place. She was in a place where it was all about her. You know, and notice it wasn't even about her son. How am I going to get along without him? 
You know, it's all about her. Um, and then lastly, there is the assumption that every good act has some ulterior motive. For example, uh, you've only helped us up to this point just so you can call out my sin and have my son die. I have my son die. Um, everything has to have an ulterior motive. Real skeptical about anything and everything. A demonstration that this woman was in need of revival. She needed something more than what she realized she needed. Now, rather than argue with her, I love the way Elijah approaches this. He doesn't sit her down and give her a Bible lesson. He doesn't, uh, you know, chat with her and try to make her feel better about herself. He doesn't open up some motivational self-help book. You know, he doesn't say, well, let's have, let's create a program so that we can sit down and work way, our way through this. He didn't do that. All right. Immediately, what Elijah does is he realizes this is a woman in despair. And he calls out God to give the son back his life. Let's fix the problem. And in fixing the problem, we may be able to restore her faith. Let's attack the problem. Let's go right to the problem. And I'm going to tell you now that it doesn't matter whether you're out of the will of God or not. If there's an issue that's going on in your life, if, if you know, let's say, you've, let's say you've fallen out of church. You got mad at the pastor. All right, and I'll just tell you, I've been in this boat. I know for a fact this happens, okay? You got mad at the pastor, fell out of church. I'm not going back and listen to that guy again. All right? And then somebody in your family falls ill or somebody dies or something happens, you know, in your life. And you think, I don't know anybody else. I'm going to call the pastor. I'm going to call the pastor and see what he says. Well, you know what? I'm not going to say, hey, listen, I, you, you haven't been to church in six months. Why should I do I'm not going to do that. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to run over there and attend to the problem as best as I can attend to the problem. I'm going to go right to it and treat them as though they've been there every single solitary service. I'm going to do my very best to be right there with them and help them through it. I'm going to, they called me and said, hey, I need you. I'm going to go. And I'm going to do the very best I can to treat them and to help them as if they had never missed a service. That's the way it ought to be. This is what Elijah does. Elijah doesn't, you know, just rail on her and, and, and eat her up with all of those things. Instead, he attacks a problem. Verse 19, he said unto her, give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom, carried him up into the loft where he abode, laid him upon his bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, hast thou brought evil upon this widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? And he stretched himself upon the child three times, cried unto the Lord, said, O Lord, my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come, in, uh, come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came in unto him again. And he revived, and Elijah took the child, brought him down out of the chamber into the house, and delivered him unto his mother. Elijah said, See... Thy son liveth, thy son liveth. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. Elijah's actions and Elijah's prayer to resolve the problem wasn't even in the presence of the mom. It wasn't, um, I mean, it wasn't intended uh, to, to solve her personal issues, he knew that, listen, if this son lives, this is going to fix mama. And his prayer was to God. Now, I'm not going to get into this because we've talked about it every time we've talked about prayer, but this was not a five-second prayer. Keep in mind, he spent time with this son, this, this child, brought him into his chamber, prayed, you know, and, and, and as custom apparently in the day, he consumed him. He laid upon him. I mean, today that might seem a little awkward, but regardless, he laid upon him and, uh, and, and basically stayed with this situation until God answered that prayer. And then he brought that child back to the, to the mama. It was his prayer, not even in the presence of the woman, that brought revival to the woman's life because he resolved the problem that had caused her to feel this way. And all of a sudden, her attitude about him, her attitude about God, everything changed because she saw for the first time what this was all about. God really does love me, hasn't forsaken me. And I think that is so important. And sometimes when we're talking about revival, revival in your life sometimes depends upon my private prayer time. Revival in your life might depend upon what I do in private to help bring you to a place of revival. 
I don't have to scold you. I don't have to stand in front of you and beat up on you. I don't have to go to your home and tell you how wicked and horrible you are. I don't have to tell you to stop being swallowed up in self-pity. I don't have to do all that right to your face and make it personal. I can do that from here because it's more generalized and we can look at our own lives. But my point being is I don't have to single you out. Sometimes just my private prayer life can make a difference in revival in your life. So when I'm talking about praying for revival, I'm not always talking about praying for revival in my life, although I need it as well. And I think Elijah probably experienced some great revival in his life during this because he saw what could take place. But my point being is what, what Elijah did brought revival to the heart and to the life of this woman. Um, there's a lot of times, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, and you guys have been here. I'm positive you guys have probably been in the same situation. How many times have you had a situation that you just prayed about and prayed about and prayed about? Never confronted it, just prayed about it, and it seems like it just resolved itself. It seems like it just, you know, God took care of it. God fixed it. And it's like I didn't have to confront it. I didn't have to do anything with it. There are times where we do have to. That's a lesson for another day. But, but there are times when sometimes we can just bring it to God, put it in the hands of God, and God can do great things. And I can't tell you the number of times I've seen that happen, and, and I just smile about it because I, I really feel in my heart that it was because of time spent in prayer about that situation and that God resolved it. Um, I, I, I ain't got time. I'd share a story, but I don't have time. All right, in the end, we see this widow's faith restored and the son's physical life even was restored. But more so, the most important thing is this widow's spiritual life was restored. That's the big issue. All right. I mean, she was down in the dumps. Physically, I'm sure she was beat. Obviously, the son was. He, he died from this illness. Um, but the big thing here is that her spiritual life was restored. She now, her faith, everything about her is renewed. The need for revival in a person's life is a serious need. I think we sometimes don't realize how great a need that it really is. And uh, you, you might not like my next statement, but here goes, okay. Quite frankly, people die all the time. While we see it as great tragedy, we understand that, God doesn't view it like we view it. I mean, death is a great tragedy to us. We lose somebody we love. They're not here with us. But the greater tragedy uh, in this, this particular circumstance, is how it was affecting the widow's faith. That was the greater tragedy. How this was affecting her life. And God did not restore this son's life for the sake of the son. He didn't do it just so that he could experience you know, all the great things in life, so he could you know, play ball and so he could get married and have grandkids for the widow. And, he didn't do it like for that reason. I hear all the time people say, well, you know, they just took his life so young. He hasn't, even, he hasn't experienced anything in life. He hasn't been able to, he's never, he's not going to be able to drive. He's not going to play ball. He's not going to, you know. Seriously, that's what you're worried about? That's what you're concerned about? In all honesty? Uh, the problem is, is how it affects the people around him. The problem was the widow, not the son. The issue was with the widow. And so God didn't restore this son's life for the sake of the son, but for the well-being of the widow. And Elijah gathered that right away. He knew what needed to take place. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourn by slaying her son? He knew. Elijah knew what the problem was. The focus was the widow. God, we need to do something to restore her faith. Um, now keep in mind, she just accused him of being the problem. He could have just taken offense to that, but instead he realized she's just in need of revival. How many times has somebody said something to you or offended you or, or mumbled and grumbled or gossiped about you and, and you said, you know what, it's okay. They're in need of revival. That's, that's what they need. They need a restoration of faith and went home and prayed about it. Or did you just get upset because they did it, you know? Or did it hurt you? Did it just offend you? Elijah immediately brushed it off and went right to the Lord and said, we need to resolve this problem. She has got a spiritual issue that needs to be resolved. So we need to have the right motives in our prayer. His motives was not about him. It was not even about the son. He knew that this woman needed to know 
that God cares. And that was the point in this. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is true. So sometimes we can ask all the right things for all the wrong reasons. But the issue here is we need to ask God to act. All right, And, and prayer is not simply worrying out loud, by the way. Um, it's, it's expressing concerns out loud. It's asking, pleading, sometimes begging God to do what needs to be done. You know, if you ask a mechanic to fix your car, the first thing that has to be done is for him to discover what's broken. I think sometimes we need to pray for what's broken. And in praying for what's broken, we realize that's where the need is. All right? And in this case, what was broken was the way she felt about the fact that her son had died. And, and what was broken was her faith. Her faith. That needed to be addressed. Uh, lastly, we do need to expect an answer. He expected God to do something. Now, he stayed with it, but he expected God to do something. Um, I'll never be any more powerful than my reliance upon my prayer life and, and, and what God can do in my prayers. I'll never be more powerful than that. Everything about who we are and what we do, it'll never be any greater than what you believe your prayers can accomplish. It'll never be any greater than that. So when we're talking about a reviving prayer, I realize that we're not talking about you as an individual, we're talking about how you influence and how you make an impact on helping to revive the people around you. And this is the way. We pray for their needs and we go directly to the problem and, and, and spend time with that and be sincere about that so that God can address those problems and those issues. He tells us we need to care for one another. Um, when he talks about, you know, the righteous man, the fervent prayers and all of that, keep in mind it was confessing one to another. It was the idea about praying one for another. And so you want a pastor, you want deacons, you want Sunday school teachers, you want friends in the church that are praying for your needs, not your wants, but your needs. And we need to be very cognizant of that. We need to be very aware of what, what God would have us to pray for. Pray for what's broken. All right? That's where revival comes. All right. Um, let's go ahead and pray and we'll be dismissed. I ran you a little bit over. Dear Father, Lord, we thank you for the time you give us. And we ask, Lord, again, that we can take these things that you've given us, take them home and be the warriors, be the people you want us to be. Lord God, may we be conscious of the needs of others and be much in prayer for them. Lord, may we not be offended by things that are said, things that are done but rather may we make it a matter of prayer that we might be able to see great revival take place in the hearts and lives of those that are around us. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Yeah.